Hello, everybody. I'm Dominic Hobson, co-founder of Future of Finance. Welcome to our webinar. The fastest and cheapest way to be operationally resilient is to change the operating model. You might well be wondering uh, quite what we meant by that. So let me uh, offer an explanation. The pandemic put existing systems of operational risk to a very interesting test, and not all of them passed it with flying colours. Financial institutions turned out to be a lot less digitalised than they thought they were. A lot of processes turned out to be a lot more manual than they looked. And employees working remotely for the first time lacked access not just to the data they needed to do their jobs, but to devices, to bandwidths, and even to cameras. Cybersecurity and data security measures that worked just fine when everybody went to the office turned out to be a major obstacle to getting anything done when nobody could actually get to the office. And those flagship, always on, always up to date backup centers turned out to be less than useful when people simply couldn't move their uh, workstation from, say, London to Basingstoke. But even before the pandemic, regulators were worrying that financial institutions had become too digitalized. What if customers lost access to digital services when there was no analog alternative, such as a bank branch with tellers in it? What if one of the big three cloud providers fell over and took a large part of the banking and insurance industries with it? What if one of the major outsourcing firms fell over, putting hundreds of billions of dollars of customer assets at risk? It seems to me that rather than rethink the questions and answers in the light of the pandemic, regulators everywhere seem to have used the pandemic to double down on plan A. For a mere calendar, the timing of the publication of the major regulatory documents and operational resilience uh, makes for quite interesting reading. The EOPA guidelines on outsourcing to cloud service providers for insurance companies, for example, came out in July 2020. The European Commission published the first version of its Digital Operational Act, DORA, in September 2020. Three US regulators published their interagency paper on sound practices to strengthen operational resilience in October 2020. The UK Financial Conduct Authority published its final rules for operational resilience in March 2021. The OSCO update of its rules on outsourcing came out in October 2021. And the Hong Kong Monetary Authority published its consultation paper on operational resilience in December 2021. In other words, all these major policy announcements took place while the pandemic was still raging in various shapes and forms around the world. None of their recommendations will be easy to implement. There is no standard model. Every jurisdiction has its nuances and its wrinkles. And of course, operational resilience costs money in legal and consulting fees, technology investments, and of course, these days, capital allocations. In fact, it's all so complicated and so expensive. And the punishments for compliance failures in terms of fines, sanctions, uh, naming and shaming are so draconian, I'm sometimes tempted to argue that regulators and regulation of themselves become a major source of operational risk. Yet I also thought the pandemic seemed to me to be full of lessons about how to do operational resilience better and at lower cost, working remotely by creating thousands of decentralized points in a network on the face of it is more resilient than a big office plus a copy of a big office just down the road. Bitcoin, which boomed during the lockdown, has yet to be hacked. None of the digital asset custodians which looked after uh, assets have yet lost any of those assets. The transfer of digital information between nodes on a blockchain network might, in the end, turn out to be a lot safer than these extended chains of intermediaries reconciling data sets. So it occurs to me, why not ditch putting ever more expensive and ever more complicated rules and procedures and governances and safeguards around the existing model and instead switch to an entirely new decentralized blockchain based and tokenized model instead? Now, that is roughly what our title was getting at. And to help us explore it, uh, we're joined by Mark Cianguana, who is a member of Graysparks Electronic Trading Risk Management Practice, where he works in compliance risk management and leads the operational resilience practice of the firm. Ian Wiles manages operational resilience within the asset servicing division of Northern Trust, the global custodian bank. Guy Warren is CEO at ITRS, which helps large organizations ensure they maintain their operational resilience by capturing and assessing data on how their applications and their operations are actually performing. In addition to our panelists, we do, of course, also have you, our audience, and all four of us encourage everybody watching or listening to submit questions and comments uh, throughout this webinar by using the Q&A functionality at the bottom of the Zoom screen. I won't be saving those questions and comments up to the end, but I will invite our panelists to address them as we go along so you can be part of this discussion right from the outset.
We're going to begin uh, with a presentation, a short presentation uh, by Mark Cienguana uh, on the various national and supranational operational resilience uh, obligations to which I alluded a few moments ago. Uh, Mark, over to you. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Mark. Um, so I'll be showing you the presentation uh, based on the article that I've done uh, right now. Can everyone see my screen? Yes, looks good. Thank you. So this presentation is based on the recent article uh, that I wrote and published uh, for Grace Box, and it was sponsored by the IT, uh, ITRS, which are an operational resilience platform provider. And so from this table that you can see here, it outlines all the uh, regulators from each of the jurisdictions from a global perspective, Australia, EU, Hong Kong, Singapore, UK, and, and the US. The reason why we selected these jurisdictions is because ITRS were interested in knowing their current approach. And so on the first row that you can see here, it shows all the regulating uh, entities, um, which include the Basel Committee, the ASIC, European Commission, Hong Kong Monetary Authority, Monetary Authority of Singapore, Bank of England, PRA and FCA, uh, the Federal Reserve, Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, and the OCC. On the second row, um, it shows um, the relevant documents from each of these regulators, which is a combination of principles, guidelines, consultation papers, and policy statements. Typically, each regulator goes through three phases, the consultation, development, and implementation phase. And most of these regulators are in the consultation and development phase. However, with the UK, they're currently in the implementation phase. This just shows that um, these regulators, there is a convergence in their approach towards operational resilience, which actually helps um, firms build a globally consistent operational resilience framework, although there tends to be some differentiation, which brings me on to the table below. So with the table below here, it compares the most recent uh, publications for these seven jurisdictions against the UK. Uh, the reason why we've put it against the UK is because the UK were one of the first to initiate the regulation and they are ahead of everyone else. On the side of the table, I have highlighted five of the key principles, which are part of the operational resilience uh, framework. And this table highlights, highlights areas of divergence and convergence. So starting off with prioritization of services, Singapore and UK, they share the same view on um, what are important business services as they explicitly factor in consumer harm. Uh, whilst the BCBS and US agencies, they do not um, factor uh, the consumer harm, which tends to leave a, a gap in their operational resilience framework because consumers are one of the core groups that get affected by operational disruptions that happen within a firm. The EU and Australia, they focus on the identification of technology systems rather than business services. Um, in terms of impact tolerances, Hong Kong and the UK share the same view of impact tolerances as they see it as the cornerstone of their approach, whilst the other regulators avoid this concept. Specifically, the BCBS and uh, the US agencies, they focus on firms adapting their risk appetite and their tolerance for disruption. Now, although risk appetite focuses on managing the likelihood of operational risk occurring and the impact if they do, the introduction of um, impact tolerances allows firms to in, um, focus on their operational resilience before any operational risks crystallize, thus allowing them to increase their capability to survive severe uh, disruptions when risk appetites are likely to be um, exceeded. In terms of um, mapping and testing, all jurisdictions agree on the value of mapping, 
as they know it is important to identify uh, the resources. And they also agree on the value of testing because firms should always demonstrate the level of preparedness um, to remain within impact tolerances. And finally, in terms of governance and oversight, all jurisdictions agree on this and place responsibility on the board of directors. But with the UK, they place specific responsibility on the chief operating officer for the implementation of operational resilience policies. And on this uh, final slide here, this is a timeline chart that shows the regulatory milestones and deadlines relating to operational resilience for the over the next few years. You may have noticed I have um, listed five out of seven regulators, which excludes the BCBS and US. And that's because no further detail um, has been provided about their timelines yet. And so just starting from the Australian regulator, the ASIC, uh, this year, they made responses to submissions received on their consultation paper, 314 from the industry. And they hope to implement the operational res uh, resilience rules at the, the beginning of next year, 2023. With, in terms of the UK regulators, uh, as I mentioned before, they're already in the implementation phase um, since um, the first quarter of 2022. And the deadline for firms, UK firms to be operationally resilient is by the first quarter of 2025. In terms of the European Commission, um, they are finalizing the DORA text, which is around uh, this period. And provided it does get finalized um, in 2022, the DORA rules are expected to commence in 2024. In terms of the Hong Kong Monetary Authority, um, every AI, which stands for Authorised Institution, they have to have a framework by uh, 2023 next year. And um, they would all um, Hong Kong um, AIs would need to be operationally resilient by quarter two, 2026. And finally, with the Monetary Authority of Singapore, uh, this year they published their revised guidelines on business continuity management which also outlines some of the operational resilience requirements. And so this, in summary, this um, timeline chart just illustrates the roadmap um, of the current and future state of each regulator. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mark, for that very helpful uh, introductory presentation. I'm taking away for it a lot of convergence, but also quite a lot of differences and certainly an awful lot of work to do starting now uh, and not finishing before 2026. And maybe once the US announces its plans, perhaps beyond that. So there's quite a um, an agenda here for, for regulated firms, particularly global firms, to, uh, to respond to over the next four to five years. But could I begin, uh, Guy, perhaps by asking you a question and go back to my to my introductory remarks about the um, lessons learned from the pandemic and how the industry has had to, all the various parts of the financial services industry have had to adapt to what occurred during the, the pandemic. And I imagine that, that firms managed their way through the pandemic, better, some firms managed better than others. But... Um, the material I've seen suggests that there was quite a lot of issues arose about security of data, for example, if you're working remotely, having access to what you need to do your job, increased risk of, of cyber attacks, loss of you know trade surveillance, easy to do when everyone's sitting on the trading desk in the office, much harder when they're scattered all over the country. Um, and of course, you're losing access to to, to your counterparts, not just your customers, but actually your service providers as well. So did the what are this is a very large question for you but what are the lessons um of the pandemic did it expose the way people were organizing their operational resilience beforehand uh as being inadequate you know you were all well set for for an earthquake or a terrorist attack but not for a pandemic um and uh what, what were the what were the and uh, maybe more forward looking what what are people having to do differently now because we haven't gone back to what we were doing before, have we? No. It's a different model. Yeah. Uh, you, you kind of touched on it uh, on your introduction. I think most of the uh, systems were set up for a concept of a robust office with 
uh, secure firewalls, sec secure access. Your your computer was was hardened. It would have software on there that would only run on there, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you know the whole idea. And if you needed a spare one, you had a spare empty building that you'd your DR center or your, your business continuity center. Same for the actual large data centers. They'd have two, possibly running a hot hot, possibly running hot warm. Uh, and they would practice failovers on a periodic basis, six, eight weeks, they'd do the failover. And that, that was the kind of failure scenario they were they were thinking of. Um, you know, bad weather and other things probably already showed that that was a bit limited. If you can't get to the offices, then can you operate the, the, the business with 20% of the staff coming in? And when you can't get to the office at all, which is what the pandemic did, suddenly you were, you were heavily stretching the remote uh, working uh, principle: Do they have enough VPN servers to take a VPN in for everyone's home? Do the computers at home have all the software they need to operate the organization properly? Um, and no, they didn't. And therefore, you know, we had, we had to install software and, and uh, open up more VPN capacity and, 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 and. That's just to let the organization keep on doing what it was doing before. You then probably also get, well, you did get an increase in uh, digital traffic, because everyone is now having to do everything electronically, very little is done in branch, um, and that would have put volumes up of, of uh, digital transactions, even even down to, you know, ordering your shopping from from uh, uh, an online store versus going in in person. So yeah, there were, there were definitely large changes to the way the, the, the organization had to deliver its services and to the demands that were made on those services. But for the most part, I didn't see too much outages that were related to that. I think you touched on a very important point when you talked about, you know, surveillance, which is more a, a trading side, but um, security. If you set your whole financial institution up for, the, and then most organisations organizations do the secure perimeter approach, the firewall approach with massive protection around the firewall, and then you penetrate it with 10, 20, 30,000 employees coming in. How do you know that all of those are good actors? How do you protect for uh, uh, having you know people to, or person logging in from two two IP addresses, which you know can't be possible, but that's a one way in which uh, um, cyber crime can go on. The operational resilience regulations, certainly the UK ones, include cyber security as a requirement. So it is not just about resilience and business continuity, although obviously cyber security can cause a down an outage, but also the theft of data, the misuse of data, is part of that regulation. So the the security risk probably went up. To an extent, perhaps the resilience also went up with remote working because you now don't have to travel into the office and, and get to the office. So, yeah, puts and takes every which way. Um, I think it was a shock for every uh, internal IT department to suddenly have to provision for thousands of remote working people and, and stay in that situation. Uh, and people seem to be coming back to the office part time, which means you're running a hybrid model of in the office and from home, uh, and we'll have to see how secure and or resilient, it's resilient, but how secure that is as a, as a, as a method going forward. Yeah, and you, 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 you lived this for real. Uh, what are the lessons that, that you and Northern Trust have taken from the pandemic, the operational resilience lessons? Absolutely, Dominic. Yeah, and and I, I echo Guy's point, really. There were absolutely uh, lessons learned from, from the pandemic, which have been ad adopted and certainly uh, can support the resilience of firms in the future. I mean, just reflecting on, on the time, really, as, on how that really played out, I think there was a real rapid deployment of um, a move to adopting business continuity plans to ensure that critical operations or important business services were continued to be provided um, in many cases, to Guy's point, there was rapid adoption of new technology and products and systems. Uh, the portal that we're sitting on today, I imagine, had a big bump through the pandemic, certainly in terms of adoption and its, its scale. Um, generally, we did find that there was close alignment with industry bodies, with governments and regulators uh, to identify real challenges, areas where perhaps regulatory relief was required from certain regulatory or legal obligations. And that really did hold up well and enabled services to be maintained, certainly during the initial phase. Um, but I think that really does demonstrate the wider need for regulated entities to continue to operate and collaborate in those trying times. Um, we did a narrow, find a narrow, that- yeah, A narrow question for you. How useful were your, your backup centers, your backup data centers and your backup operational centers? 
Well, of course, the uh, in, in the use of a sort of a deployed redundancy site, um, it, with the case of of lockdown, there was there was not the ability to use those sites. So it really was the, the leading into those technology capabilities, the deployment of additional materials, whether that's laptops, whether that's as Guy mentioned, the additional investment in VPN to ensure that there's the capability to have thousands of people online on the same servers at the same time. I think that's really where we saw the the key investment, um, multiple years worth of investment going in in a matter of months. Um, and, really, and technologies like Zoom and uh, Teams became mission critical. They, they came from, you know, supporting business activity to the only way in which you could get your job done. I think that was a, another one that happened. And I think what we do find now that that does bring uh, new risks, new residency risks through, uh, as Kai mentioned, the, the deployment of the hybrid working now. There is now greater concentration risk around certain internet providers, uh, the, the current energy crisis that we're going through, again, highlights areas where perhaps there's new scenarios, new risks that we need to consider in the events of uh, brownouts or blackouts, perhaps, um, ensuring that where previously we may have sent people from the office to their home locations or to a residency site, we now need to factor in the idea where they may be working from home and need to return to the office to continue uh, delivering those services. Mm -hmm. Was outsourcing the firms to which functions or, or were outsourced? Were they a particular problem in the pandemic? Did, did you learn something from how you interact with outsourcing service providers during that period? I, I, I agree. I think so. And whether that's uh, an out, whether that's an intercompany outsourcing arrangement where you may have service centres located in other locations in other cities or other countries, or as you say, whether you depend on a particular critical third party. I think there's a lot of reflection over the contracts you have in place. Almost, and this is really leaning into what we see from a regulated perspective in the recent discussion papers, minimum residency standards perhaps being introduced where there's an expectation of residency built into the contract that you take from that particular service provider. Uh, lots of focus on exit strategies ensuring that in the event where you have to assume that your, your vendor may fail in the future, you have that failover capability, whether that's to take it back in-house or whether to move over to an alternative provider at, at short notice. Mm -hmm. So uh, it accelerated digitalization in, in, in some respects, and there are pros and cons to, to remote working. In one sense, it increases resilience. In another sense, it creates a whole set of new risks around uh, data and particularly cybersecurity. So let, let's move on a bit now and go back to, to, to Mark's presentation. And perhaps, Mark, I could ask you this question. In your presentation, yeah. you, you, you got across that there is some convergence here. But if I'm a global financial services institution operating in those six jurisdictions and on a global scale, if we include the seventh, um, you know, the BCBS, IOSCO rules as well, it's not mm. a trivial task to make sure you're fully compliant with all these these regulations. Would it be fair if I was a, a global firm to say, well, you're really asking me to do too much. You guys need to sit down and standardize your requirements much more closely than you have done so far. Is that a fair well, complaint? I guess because there tends to be like a growing convergence again, between these regulators, as I've highlighted. Um, yeah, sometimes with the requirements that uh, a firm needs to adhere to, sometimes it could tend to overlap or they could be duplicative because, you know, the different terminologies that are being used across different jurisdictions. However, um, you know, no amount of convergence is going to eliminate any, like, differences across these um, jurisdictions. And, you know, of course, it can be costly and it could be um, time consuming as well. But having it globally, um, seeing it from a, a global perspective where you're meeting um, these uh, regulations that we've noticed where like a lot of uh, firms like follow like what the UK um, approach on, on things because one, it helps them understand the resilience of their importance services in respective of locations. Um, it helps them even though like wherever they're at, they can actually adjust to like specific requirements that their um, jurisdictions provide. Um, two, it would be also allow them to, you know, present that resiliency whenever like external auditors or even the regulators ask them to just demonstrate um, in their approaches. And one thing like I noticed what the uh, UK regulator said is, yes, there are different jurisdictions have different views on what they consider what's critical, what's important, but as long as the principles are, are aligned, then firms and their supervisors should be able to work effectively across borders. 
Mm -hmm. So there is a kind of natural convergence happening here where regulators are reading each other's documents and, and converging on a set of norms, basically. But I think the Dominic, um, yeah, the, 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 um, the Ian the first, then Guy. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> the, the real strength in the regulation, I think, lies in the simplicity in a lot of the ways. There's, and that's probably why we have seen a high level of um, international coordination. And I think the, the principles are very simple. And it's actually quite difficult to say it's a bad thing to be operationally resilient. Um, mm. You know, to show material improvements in your own firm's self-awareness of your operational resilience capability and fixing any gaps that come from that. So I think generally um, where we are seeing a very principle-based outcome-focused um, policy statements here, then they're, they're very much um, uh, driving through that coordination you're seeing from an international perspective. Yeah, a lot of regulation gets started in one jurisdiction, goes to the, the BIS, the Bank of International Settlements, or uh, the BSCS, and then there's a committee there will look at it, say this is sensible for the rest of the world to look at, and then each of the regulators pick it up and implement it. So it happened to be the FCA this time, it happened to be, so I, you know, if I was guiding someone who does have multi-jurisdictional um, requirements, I would say that the FCA is probably the starting point uh, with the business impact, for instance, which is not carried through to all other jurisdictions, but is good practice, I would have said. Uh, DORA is interested in the European one where they're going heavily on third party and third party liability. You need to do risk assessments of your third party. Uh, all of them drive an increasing audit responsibility. We get audited by all of our major financial clients. So, you know, I think between the FCA and DORA, you've probably got as stringent a set as, as you would need. And almost every other regulator would be okay if you were meeting their requirements. Um, but it, the, the business impact one is interesting where, they, you know, it would have been a commercial decision if you're an example would be if it's supposed to take five seconds for you to be able to log on uh if you if yours is a really bad website and you're taking 10 or 15 your customers are pissed off they'll leave you and go to someone else okay commercial decision now they're saying no i'm sorry if you say your log on should take five seconds you need to know when it's taking 10 and you have to tell me that you're breaching your own sla so you know that, that makes it a much more onerous set of requirements. If your payments or faster payments are supposed to be done within you know, a certain period of time, you have to know when they're not getting through in that period of time. So I think the the uh, and that's probably good practice. I think to to know how long things are supposed to take and know when they're not taking that length of time uh, is not a commercial issue. It's it's a customer issue. If if I can't log on after forty five seconds, I'm probably going to give up. And if it does, if it would have let me through at sixty seconds, that's a moot point. It, as far as I was concerned, my app wasn't working. Now, Guy, that prompts a, a, a question in my mind. You're in the business of, of collecting data from firms which are measuring operational performance in presumably in areas exactly like that. Yep. Uh, Ian said a minute ago, this is principle based approach is great. Now, these are principle based, but they're also increasingly, if, and correct me if I'm wrong, these seem more stringent than the old, you know, do a bit of risk management, do a bit of operational risk management yeah. rules, which we've had over the last 10 years. This is actually much more stringent than that. And so if my question to you really is, how are the regulators going to enforce this? Do they have access to the same sort of data you do to say what well, to say to a bank? Well, actually, you said you do this, this and this according to your service level agreements, but actually you're falling behind by 40 percent on this one, 60 percent on that one, 70 percent on that one. And as a result of that, we're going to fine your chief technology officer and your chief operations officer 25 percent of their bonus this year uh, for falling short of those targets. How yeah. are these more stringent measures actually going to be enforced? Do regulators have the data to make sensible judgments? They make you give them the data. So, that, and you have to define your business critical services, you have to define your impact tolerances of those services, and then you have to report against them. So uh, they're, 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 they have the information because you hand it over to them. That's what the regulation says you have to do. You have to, you have to show them. And also regulators are asking for that. So some are just saying, you know, map them out, test them, make sure they're thorough, make sure that if they fail, you recover, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Others are saying, no, you'll need to evidence that you have set a threshold and you know when you've breached your own threshold. Mm -hmm. So uh, it'll be self-reporting and therefore you will have told them, the regulator, I've breached my own tolerance. And will the will an, will an officer of the company be sanctioned? I mean, I took the yeah, top look at the FCA website to see yeah, if anyone actually been yeah, sanctioned. Yeah, yeah, but... yeah. I couldn't find anybody who had. So, well, the SMF, the SMF came in, uh, I think, March this year, uh, the SMF 24, which is a role, senior management function, where named officers, they're allowed up to three, actually, um, are themselves personally regulated. I've been personally regulated in the past uh, for, yeah. for client funds, CF10A. And you, you sign a very long contract with the regulator to say, I take this very seriously. Um, I mean, generally, it's very, you know, uh, respectful 
relationship. You have to provide the data you said you're going to provide. They go through it in detail, provided you take any breaches or issues seriously, and you say, I have the authority within my company to fix this. They let you get on and fix it. They're not here to penalize people who are trying to do a good job. It's where you say, well, I'm afraid my company don't think this is very important. They haven't given me any money. Uh, we seem to be breaching it five quarters running and I'm still not getting any better. Now, now you'll get come under enhanced supervision or they'll come in and they'll find, you know, they, they have a range of actions they can take against you. But, um, you know, I think it's about being grown up and taking it seriously. And by naming people and senior people, generally the organizations are used to this. We've had it on, on the client fund side and other parts of our organization, uh, uh, financial institutions, where individuals get um, regulated, the organization has to back them up and support them. People won't take the role on if, if, if your organization can let to hang you out to dry. And I think going back to, to, to Guy's original point, you know, this borne out was originally through, you know, uh, the regulators, the policy, policy makers saw issues, uh, operational disruption in the banking sector, largely driven by technology outages, uh, which led, the, I guess, the policy makers to consider that the traditional non-financial risk approach wasn't cutting it well enough. So additional public policy was needed and hence the, the, the introduction of a operational resilience requirements was really uh, going back to that principle and outcome space. It's really a fundamentally different way to think about non-financial risk. Uh, and there is a real temptation here to think about policy compliance. And that really does need to be lent against uh, at your firms to focus on as you focus on your individual operational resilience journey, recognize there are ways, many ways to address the problems but try to be thoughtful and how and prepared and how you engage with the supervisors to demonstrate that you've taken the regulation to heart. It's definitely better when individuals are named and regulated as well as the institution, because if it's just institutional, the responsibility is more diffuse and, and the outcomes, if you get fined, yeah, individuals are going to get their bonuses dinked or, you know, the careers being damaged or even may have to resign. But when you have a regulated person, I know from having been a CF10A, your chief exec takes that very seriously. You've taken on a very, very responsible role on behalf of the company. They back you up and, and uh, you know make sure that you're able to get your job done. A very serious step by a regulator to name and shame a firm for operational resilience shortcomings, wouldn't it? That might put the they, entire business they, at risk. Yeah, not not really. I think that, that to an extent, you know, there have been um, uh, c- companies named already in the UK where they're being investigated. That just says that they are already giving information that says there are issues. Um, one on cybersecurity, I think one on, on resilience. So I think the, company, the, regula- the regulated entities are, don't like it, but they're used to it being a necessary evil that when you have a, uh, an issue with the regulator, it will be in the public domain. It's not a private. The discussions are private until you've breached it, and then they do announce that you've breached it. Mm-hmm. I'd like to remind our audience we're interested in your questions and comments. So if you if you are burning to ask a question or say something, do please go ahead and and, and do so. I, I a thought occurs to me listening to 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 what uh, um, uh, you've just said, Guy, and what, and what Ian has said, which is that you could argue that the relationship between regulated firms and regulators after the two thousand seven eight Great Financial Crisis was actually quite hostile. The industry was being re-regulated. There wasn't as far as I could see, that much collaboration, cooperation going on. But here's a case where, as Ian says, you've got this principle-based system. It's an outcome-based thing. Everybody's interested in in the system becoming more resilient and and regulators, as well as regulated, have a huge interest in making sure that happens and understanding each other's position. Uh, The regulators, because they need to understand what's going on inside firms. You know, if if there's mass increase in cloud outsourcing, for example, they need to know that. They need to understand what, what risks that represents. And they can't find that out without talking to regulated firms. Would you say that relationships between the regulators and the regulated are where they need to be in terms of exchange of of information or is there a kind of wariness still between the two camps post re-regulation of the industry? I'll let Ian go first on that one. I think there's certainly a transactional relationship that's ongoing uh, where that supervision is in place. And I think it's important to have two way feedback in all of those examples uh, to Guy's point. The self-assessments are a key foundation around how uh, a firm has approached their resilience uh, posture and uh, designed their resilience framework, uh, identified their important business services and then set tolerances for those appropriately. I think what's important on the back of that is to then um, to 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 then for the regulators to be able to give 
firms a holistic industry-wide view of approaches that are being taken, especially where you see consolidation in sector parts. So whether um, you, you are looking at a particular part of the industry where there's common firms, there's loads of value that can be gained from those firms um, understanding um, how important business services have been approached and set accordingly. I feel um, at the moment it feels as if there's um, very good collaboration across industry uh, in terms of lessons learned, information sharing to a point. Uh, there doesn't seem to be a competitive advantage, certainly at this point, uh, being resilient uh, as an outcome uh, to benefit end consumers uh, isn't something that has a margin to it. So it's something that, that definitely can benefit from having that two-way conversation and super information between supervisors and uh, regulated firms. To be, to be specific on this point, Ian, do you have access, if there's a big operational incident at a competing firm or even a non-competing firm, is there a forum in which you can get access to that information so you can learn from it and maybe make changes to your own operational processes to make sure it doesn't happen to you? Or are people kind of holding that? I know we've had this problem, you know, for example, with cyber attacks where firms are a bit embarrassed and don't particularly wish to disclose that uh, a bot was inside their systems for three years before it was activated. And regulators have complained about lack of exchange of information. Are you seeing anything like that on the operational resilience side? I mean, I think taking lessons learned is not an insular thing. You have to look, you have to horizon scan, you have to look outwardly to see how other firms have been impacted and how that may impact yourself. Uh, there are absolutely uh, are, are active regulatory bodies, specific, specifically around operational resilience, that are very active in this space for the financial services sector and um, are able to coalesce firms to not necessarily prescriptively share uh, examples, but certainly um, lead into those lessons learned that can really help all, part, all, all uh, bodies to uh, ensure that they're resilient and to you know, test accordingly in the future. The consulting firms play a big part in here. They cross-pollinate. So, you know, PwC did a lot of the uh, failure analysis when there were major outages, and I think NatWest had one back in the day, and they became you know, one of the leading firms when, when people had an outage. Uh, were trusted by the regulator. They'd write a good report when there was a failure, and you could always employ them to say, what did you find and what did you do? Grace Park, you know, in the capital market space, again, very strong. You ask them about operational resilience. They'll tell you what they're seeing as an industry norm, what best practice might be. So I think they act, you know, they can add a lot of value at crossing boundaries without naming names sometimes, so that you can keep your anonymity. But best practice gets uh, cross pollinated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with what um, Kyle was saying because, like, even like with with us as Grace Spark, like, where you know the the great good thing about us is we're able to like capture information from like um, what's going on in the market to actually um, have an overview on like how how we can help and also inform other um, participants of going on without having like, again, to di disclose names and actually give them like a view of like, you know, what firms are looking to do in the next six months. Um, for example, like firms are now starting to like, look into things around like management information, um, where it's just important to find out like things around like monitoring the data of like all, all their services, the impact tolerances, and, you know, just seeing like where the market is going so that at least people know like, because obviously each each firm is at different stages of the development of their operational resilience framework. And so this is where like we are able to like pinpoint like what stages they're at and how we can actually offer that support to, to help them. Okay, so I'm I'm hearing that the regulators don't want to prescribe what best practice is here, but they do expect regulated firms to buy a process of iteration and information exchange to arrive at what best practice is and to share that amongst themselves. Now I'd like to move on a bit and talk about about outsourcing risk, which we've which we've touched on 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 here. Uh, one of the documents I I referred to in my opening remarks was was IOSCO, a capital markets organisation, obviously, but they did update their principles on on outsourcing risk, which they've been publishing actually for a long time since since two thousand and five, uh, when outsourcing in the capital markets industry really started to take off. It, has the has outsourcing risk changed? I mean, back in those days, you were you were kind of opening a, a, a an, an in-house outsourced operation if you like in India or you were outsourcing to to TCS or or um Infosys or whoever it was but now the cloud has really taken off for for example has 
has an, and maybe maybe Mark, you're you're quite well placed to to address this question first. But has the nature of outsourcing risk changed, and do firms need? How good are they actually at doing their due diligence on on <laughs> other firms which they outsource crucial functions? Yeah, um, funny enough, like I actually wrote an article regarding um, firms like utilizing like third party systems to help them with um, the operational resilience. I think like from like what we noticed from like the pandemic, um, I think from the report that I, I, I read, they were saying around how 40% of like third party relationships are not subject to due diligence checks, which can actually be create some like supplier risk um, in terms of like not knowing, um, you know, the nature of the vendor that you're onboarding into your systems um, and just knowing like how, um, it can impact your firm, and so like one of the things that um, we we like we advised in 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 the article that I wrote was just how like um, firms can start looking into like detecting um, you know all the, all like the risks and not just onboarding vendors just for for the sake of it, but also like how they would operate throughout the whole like vendor life cycle, um, things around like building like inbuilt like automated um, alerts to like notify bank when a vendor goes beyond like accept acceptable thresholds um, so that at least they can actually proactively um, you know take measures to to address those those risks mm -hmm. yeah it, it, it's quite an insidious thing outsourcing was always you know associated with either a business service outsourcing someone's doing a piece of processing for you mm -hmm. or a technology outsourcing they're running your data center but now it's so multi-layered from, oh, let's go with, I, I, Ian made a very interesting point right at the beginning that I sort of missed electricity. So back in the day, every bank would have a generator system in case they had a power cut to the data center, the generators cut in and your data center keeps running, fine. And it probably powers the offices where the staff are working, fine. But if you're getting blackouts or brownouts in Britain at home, Ian's having to bring the people back into the offices where the power is assured. Even power is a third party service that we all have to call upon. And should there be blackouts, uh, business services will be will be impacted. So this and if you shoot for, let's say, 99.9% availability, that sounds pretty high, but it's actually eight hours of downtime a year. You, you tell the regulator as an organization, we're going to run at 99.9. So you're fine. You try and set your organization up to meet that no more than eight hours of downtime. It's not easy, but you could do it. And then someone says, well, you do know that our cloud provider is only 99.9. And if their eight hours are different from ours, we're actually got 16 hours. Okay, fine. And then, you know, we're using a third party trading platform or core banking platform. They've given us 99.9, .9, but their eight hours might be different from the cloud providers and from our own eight hours. So now we're up at 24 hours. And you can see it's a it's the compound of all the availability of all the services necessary to make up your target. And, you know, if people don't want to contract to higher than 99.9. .9, that seems pretty extreme. But the, the organization is now subject to all the failures that can, you know, take a service out uh, uh, upstream. So uh, it's complex. And, and DORA, the, the Europeans, have said, right, you need to do a third party risk assessment and work out who is going to, who can hit three nines, four nines, you know, 99.5. Uh, and you need to do audits back down the, the, the uh, supply chain. Uh, so my organization, they came in and audited tools that I use that are SaaS delivered to me. And I'm writing software and providing software through to regulated organizations. And they're going two steps back down the journey to make sure that the tools that I use are robust and, and, and securely configured. So we talked about security being as important as availability. So yeah, it's, it's getting hard now for regulated entities to, to manage that very complex supply chain and to ensure it's secure all the way back down the, down the line. I think it is really evolving over time, certainly. And, and I think certainly with what we've seen from a, a UK regulator perspective with the recent critical third parties to the UK financial sector discussion paper is that there, that's largely driven by the, the increase in the use of cloud, certainly uh, from an outsourcing provider perspective, uh, which brings with it uh, greater challenges to the regulators, especially where a lot of these providers are non-regulated out of the regulator's reach and therefore, they're looking to bring in public policy to effectively legislate so that they're able to get um, a framework in place that allows you to identify your potential critical third parties, allows them to then set minimum resiliency standards for those third parties. 
uh, and then really looks to encourage that the resiliency testing of those critical third parties, which could be using, um, which could be set by the regulator themselves and also use a range of tools and focused on the material services that they provide to firms and other FMIs. So I think that's really central to the framework. That's the provision of that information by critical third parties to the regulators so that they can then use that to measure resilience. Mm. I'm glad you brought up cloud because I, I heard a presentation by a senior official at IOSCO last summer who said, if you want to know what we're worrying about in the, in the short term future, it's it's the cloud. The point being that if nine out of 10 firms in a financial sector are using uh, AWS or Azure, and as you say, Ian, these are not firms regulated in quite the same way as, as financial institutions are, you get all the problems you get with outsourcing in general, you get the due diligence might not work, you then have to manage the risk when, you, when you've when you got this relationship in place, and you've got this concentration risk on top of it. So their concern was you might have fewer operational catastrophes uh, if everybody's on the cloud, but when a catastrophe does occur, it's a really, really serious one, and it might take down dozens of firms um, at once. So I, 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 I sense this is a new area, but but you feel, and Guy, maybe it's a question for you, do you feel the regulators are striking the right balance here? Uh, you know, you've got all these outsourcing institutions in this chain, <laughs> and now they're talking about cloud. It's only one in the, one among many, really, but is the balance correct here? Um so the, the, there's a, the, you try to balance two things here. It's a bit like home working. Home working clearly gives you resilience because you're not dependent on one office being up and available. Um, when there was uh, a lot of trading between, particularly capital markets, a lot of trading between the, the counterparties, OTC, over-the-counter trading, uh, the regulator felt I'm a bit blind to what's going on. And they were you know, surprised to find out that, that certain products like LIBOR were being manipulated. Uh, and then they found it out and penalized a few people and said, well, we want to see those trades done on liquidity venues. So now you've moved a, a peer-to-peer risk to a concentrated risk that it's going through uh, a, a trading venue, that's a good thing because you get the visibility and you can see the trades going through in the last you know, 20 seconds or you know, a couple of minutes of the uh, of working day. Um, but conversely, you've created a concentration rig. If that venue's down, then that asset class can't be traded for that day. So, And, and the same would be true of cloud. If, if you're relying on every single financial institution to be able to run its data centers to four nines availability, 99.99, you know, some of them just aren't going to get there. If you move them to the cloud and the cloud can run at four nines, that feels a lot better. But if the cloud is down, when it is down, every single person who's used that asset is is uh, going to be impacted by it. So, you know, you, it, you can try and make it um, more resilient because it's got the, the, the one thing that the cloud providers have to do is provide a real resilient service. That's their commercial model. Um, but when they're out, this, they're going to be uh, more impacted. But one of the triggers, I think, for the FCA even doing this was a uh, card provider in the UK who have 90% of all debit cards go through through that provider, had a 10-hour outage in the UK. And, of course, constituents are writing to their MPs. The MPs are writing through to Treasury Committee. Treasury Committee went to the Bank of England and the FCA and said, you know, we can't have the general public in the UK not able to access their money for 10 hours. You know, should we have 90% of all credit cards cleared by one card provider should it be should there be more players in there so so you know less people are impacted by it conversely if, if that provider's up all the time which i don't know that they've had a significant outage since uh it's a very resilient infrastructure to rely on mm. that treasury concentration risk uh, yeah. that treasury committee report was a very interesting document if you're interested in in retail operational resilience questions i think mm. now, we've had some um questions in from members of the audience so be good to deal with those in the, in the last winter our last 10 minutes now uh, andrew gad asks this question does the growing use of um business selected SaaS software as a service platforms make it more difficult for operations departments to know the landscape they are dealing with you're nodding uh guy i don't i don't not sure i fully understand yeah. the question Do you, yeah 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 so yeah. so you know there's we all you always used to buy software either perpetual license or, or subscription license and then we set up our own hardware and we ran it it'd be as resilient as that piece of software which is generally pretty good and we are at running our computers and it would sit in our data center so if we can get 99.9 availability in our data center then that service is up and running along with everything else that we're doing when i buy it as SaaS, 
Now it will have one security stance, which I will obviously ask them, but it's as good as their security stance is. And it'll have an availability as good as their availability is. When I have an outage, I've definitely impacted my business. When they have an outage, they'll impact my business, which will then impact my customers. So this is the compound effect I was trying to talk to. The more other providers you have in, as part of the overall service you provide, the greater the the risk of an outage. It, it's 99.9 times the availability of every single key component that, that delivers your service. And it just gets worse and worse and worse. So that's why I had one of my customers ask me about Salesforce and Zendesk, two of the pieces of software I use, how well configured was it? What resilience did we have? How secure was it? Who had access to it? You know, they, they were having to go back to a SaaS provider I used to make sure that I could deliver my service to them so that they could deliver their service to the street. Um, so yes, it, and it's harder. I mean, I can ask Zendesk and Salesforce how secure their data is and, you know, <laughs> good luck with, with getting a strong answer. Mm -hmm. Uh, we've had a question, an anonymous question here, which is um, maybe along the same lines. A challenge I have seen facing a number of financial institutions has been around the testing of third parties, as you're limited to the amount of testing you can actually do as compared to testing internally built systems. How do you see firms overcoming this challenge going forward? So, Guy, you've just talked about, you know, testing third party software delivered as a service. We're talking about how can you test the yeah. system? We're seeing, a, we're seeing a lot of demand for this um, because it, uh, it depends on what the service is, to be honest. If the service is mostly de delivered as a browser, uh, you're waiting for your internal staff who are using that service to say, oh, I think Salesforce is really slow this morning or I can't get I can't get to some of the, the records or whatever it is. So we've done we have a we have a capability to do um, uh browser monitoring you know it's generally done from outside your firewall it's called synthetic monitoring and, and real user monitoring but we have a version that runs inside the firewall so we can check the SaaS services that you're consuming we're actually testing is salesforce got slower this morning is is, is it offline and, and i named salesforce but you know there are business platforms as well mm -hmm. where they're now being turned from on-prem to SaaS, and now you can't see what testing's gone on failure scenario testing but at least you can get visibility and alerting apis has gone even further so the open banking apis every bank is worried about making sure they're available and performant um, and then you're also consuming APIs inside your organization. It might be a credit checking service or an AML or a fraud service, et cetera. You need to know if that API is up, working and performant because the software platforms that are talking to it need that service to be there. And you can't wait for the platform to complain. You have to check the API. So yes, but you, what you can't do, and the questioner is quite right, you can't go and do a failover scenario back in their data center. They won't let you. You can't try and do a, you know, a, 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 what's called a white um, a white box check. We, we would go and check the source code and, and the quality of, of our products. You can't do that back into the, the service providers. Well, you can try and do it when you contract with them, but it's not a regular thing you can do. Mm -hmm. Ian, uh, I, I thought you were about to say something. Do, do these questions resonate with you? Absolutely, Dominic. Yeah, and, and I think uh, this is probably an area that, that needs the greatest level of sophistication, especially across service provider firms and other you know, entities, regulated entities, is really just ensuring that there's a good uh, collaboration around testing approaches. Uh, certainly, uh, I think there's, uh, historically, there's been quite a lot of reliance on existing testing measures, uh, really without taking that step change to an operational resiliency-based testing. So what that means is that you could perhaps, a lot of reliance on typical business continuity testing, or maybe some operational risk testing around ICAP. And I think really what the policymakers are trying to get firms to look at is a really uh, um, expansive view of how you uh, design your testing scenarios and then execute them. And that could lead to future more collaboration in the future between firms. Um, certainly, uh, greater use of industry exercises, I, I'm sure, would be a, one area where we expect to see greater uh, standardization or greater use of those in the future, certainly where there are a, a small number of firms perhaps uh, particularly concentrated in one particular area of the, of the industry. Mm -hmm. I, I always say there are four pillars to operational resilience. The first is a resilient architecture. So have you got single points of failure? Do you test failure scenarios within code, within architectures, within databases, within data centers? Obviously, they, they do do that. Um, 
The second one is testing. We just mentioned that. Do you obviously have functional testing to make sure your service does what it should do, but then you've got non-functional testing around what volumes can it tolerate, how does it fail and fail over, et cetera. The third is change and change management. How much change do you have coming through your estate in a given change window or, or on a you know, normal working day? And do you have change risk management? There's now software coming through, AI tools, which will try and quantify which are the riskiest changes you can make and make sure that you put more uh, protection around those. And the fourth one is you know, monitoring and visibility and, and knowing what's working and what's not working. We sit in the fourth one for the most part, but if those other three disciplines aren't strong, all we're gonna do is tell you you've got loads of production issues. You really need good software architecture design, thorough testing of all scenarios and non-functional testing and careful change management. And then monitoring is a lot easier. Or gives you better results anyway. And I think I think there is an emphasis on regulators on on greater use of maybe testing to fail as well. So yeah. perhaps um, the scenarios may be set to a level which would be comfortably achievable, but certainly uh, you no know, setting a, a scenario that you know you would go beyond your impact tolerance does give you some important lessons learned uh, to uh, to become more resilient in the future. Mm-hmm. We're into our last uh, four minutes now, so um, I'd just like to to take each of you back to the, to, the, to the question posed in the title of our session today and in my in my opening remarks. It's a sort of futuristic question, but I'd be interested to know what each of you thinks ab- about this. And it may be a naive question, but what if the, the industry, and of course the industry covers lots of different uh, sectors, but let's imagine it covering, we're covering banking, uh, asset management, insurance, and the industry moves to a new operating model in which it makes use of uh, some of the technologies and techniques thrown up by blockchain, by artificial intelligence, by machine learning, uh, and so on. Do you think ever that, or, or do you ever envisage a world in which if you were operating differently, maybe your, your chains of intermediaries, which help you deliver your services were shorter, uh, your information exchanges were, um, were more secure, more rapid, uh, your APIs were standardized, you were using smart contracts and so on. Can you imagine an operating model which would be, um, in principle, operationally more resilient because it was different from the one with which you're working today? I don't know who, to, perhaps Ian, you could um, deal with that difficult question first and let me know whether it's just too futuristic for you to, to address now or whether you can imagine a future which is operationally more resilient intrinsically because of the technology and techniques that are being used. I think that's really what the the policymakers are trying to drive firms towards to to becoming more resilient. So whether that, as you say, Dominic, is is perhaps through the use of more um, uh, sophisticated technologies to enable greater digitalization, to ensure greater automation through that, to make yourself more resilient. But fundamentally, uh, the principles of measuring your uh, what services you deliver to an end user, setting your tolerances, mapping those services, and then testing appropriately, those are fundamental principles which will be remain the same regardless of whether you move towards uh, a futuristic operating model, you remain on the same approach. I feel that, that those key principles, so long as they um, are maintained and they're, they come with real top-down engagement as a girl, I, I think that's really important. And, and, and firms that are successful in doing that will work out how to pivot, I feel, this conversation on resiliency from a risk management conversation um, to how you will generate generate value in your business agility, in your innovation, coming back to the operating model question, but also how you understand your better and having that operational resiliency capability. Mark, you've heard Ian say that the fundamentals don't change. Whatever technology you're using, would would you agree with that? Or do you think that there is something else to add about moving to a new operating model, improving operational resilience? I would say, yeah, the those like fundamentals that Ian has said, like like I was mentioning earlier about the article, like it's part of the operational resilience framework, and that's what makes up um what operational resilience is. Um, and yeah, it's irrespective of like what technology you use, because even like where the regulator talks about like how uh, on an annual basis you want to be like looking at your impact bonuses and your business uh, services and your mapping your resources on an annual basis, it's like a, it's like it's a continuous development that firms are going to have to adhere to once they've established their framework. And of course, like um, 
with time, this is where like they can actually start to uh, adopt, you know, technology of course solutions that can actually help um, take all that data and you know feed that to the bank to just you know give them an update on like how you know how their services are doing how how they're doing with their their impact tolerances so, so that it can inform the right people to make the right decisions when it comes to making investments to see how they can improve themselves. Guy, a last word from you. You've heard Ian say the fundamentals don't change with the technology. You've heard Mark say that actually you can't jump from where you are to a new operating model in one go anyway. You're going to be iterating your way towards the future all the time and you need to remain resilient throughout that process. Any final thought from you on whether yeah, there's magic uh, bullets here? I, I don't think the magic bullets, but most of the new mechanisms we brought in to deliver financial services, we haven't decommissioned the old ones. So you can still write a cheque. Uh, you know it's going to take you a number of days before that's presented, and then it'll take a couple of days after that before the funds are withdrawn and, and transferred to the thing. And you, we give ourselves so long between writing the cheque and, and the money's being moved that you're very rarely going to breach any SLA. But then we kept on bringing in new and newer ways, ATMs which have to be up and available, and then websites where you're expecting a payment. We brought in faster payments, uh, and our, our time window has got narrower and narrower and narrower that we will accept anything can't be done. It has to be done now, you know, a, a matter of seconds. And some payments will, will wait one day. Um, but I think by having lots of different technologies, so if blockchain were coming in, it wouldn't be instead of, it would probably be as well as classical relational databases and cash, classically centrally controlled fiat currencies. And therefore you'd have the choice. Well, I'm not gonna clear this through Swift. I'm gonna send this through blockchain. And that, that having that choice actually gives you more resilience naturally because you will be blocked out on occasions from either of those. The blockchain isn't available, unlikely, or you know, Swift's down or whatever. So I think the increase in different uh, operating models are not instead of, but as well as, and that probably makes it easier to be absolutely resilient, albeit you've got to be, you've got to be plumbed into all of them. It makes it messier, but probably more resilient. Mm -hmm. Yeah, more complex, but more resilient. That's a good note to, to end on. We must stop there. Our time is up. Uh, I'd like to thank our panellists, Mark uh, Singuana from Grace Park, Ian Wiles from Northern Trust, and Guy Warren from ITRS. It's been a very interesting discussion. Thank you also to you, the audience, for your questions, your, your, your comments. Here at Future of Finance, our next event is just a week today, Thursday, the 24th of November. And it is, now the pandemic is behind us, actually a physical uh, rather than a webinar event. It's being held at the National Liberal Club in Whitehall Place here in London. And our topic is how long must we wait for the flagship security token issuers to arrive? And in it, we'll be exploring the continuing refusal of the security token markets to fulfil their potential. I know that some of you will be joining us then, uh, and I look forward to seeing you. Mm -hmm.